Hello and welcome to Euphobia. Today's story is one of the most off-the-wall cases we've ever covered. We're talking cannibalism, UFOs, conspiracy theorists, and a body that was never recovered. It's pretty wild stuff, so let's dive into the mind-boggling story of the murder of Gurley Chu Hassenkoft. On the morning of September 10, 1999, the employees of an Albuquerque bank were growing increasingly concerned when their co-worker, Gurley Chu Hoffenkoft, did not show up for work. Now, normally, I'm sure you're probably thinking, okay, she's a little late to work, what's the big deal? Well, Gurley was dealing with a lot in her personal life, and it had become so pervasive that she had confided in her co-workers at the bank. They were aware that sweet, soft-spoken Gurley had been in an abusive relationship with her now ex-husband. Gurley had been born in Malaysia, but during a vacation to the US, she met her eventual husband at SeaWorld, and the two were married a few years later in 1993. But over the years, things had gotten so bad that she had recently taken out a restraining order against him, and in the past week had told a co-worker, if I don't show up to work, call the police. So once this dark prophecy came true, her co-workers didn't hesitate to phone the police. But because she had only been missing for a few hours, there wasn't much the police could do for them. So a co-worker decided to leave work to check in on her. When he arrived at her apartment, he found that Gurley's car was in the parking lot, but the door to her apartment was locked. He enlisted the help of the super to let him in, and when they opened the door, they found the apartment to be untouched. Nothing was amiss. But alas, Gurley was not inside. The only strange thing they saw when they entered was a few wet spots on the living room carpet, almost like someone had spilled something and then tried to clean it up with a steam cleaner. It was around this time that the police were finally convinced to go check out Gurley's apartment for themselves. And when they arrived, they talked to the super who told him that he had already gone inside and nothing seemed to be wary. He did not mention the stains. What he did tell them was that Gurley had recently moved into this apartment to get away from her ex and was a victim of domestic abuse. The police asked for the ex's name and address and he said, Dyson Hossenkoft. When police went to investigate Dyson, they found his door completely wide open and nothing inside. The apartment was totally empty. They spoke to a neighbor who told him that a moving truck had come a few nights before and Dyson had told him that he was moving closer to Mexico in order to get his cancer treatments. This is when police started to put together that they knew Dyson from previous reports Gurley had made to them about domestic abuse. In fact, he was two weeks away from standing trial for violating her restraining order. And all of this makes them even more concerned, so they go back to Gurley's to take a look at her apartment and they immediately noticed the stains and determined that they were blood stains. They also said that the apartment smelled suspiciously like bleach. So they call in some investigators who do luminol tests to confirm that it is in fact blood. And from there, things kick into high gear. At almost the same time, on a highway 90 minutes outside of Albuquerque, a state employee is driving on a remote stretch of the highway when he notices something high up on the embankments. It appears to be a blanket of some kind. So in an effort to make sure that it doesn't blow into the highway to cause an accident, he pulls over and decides to clear it away. Also, his job was to collect the trash from roadside stops, so he wasn't that much of a good Samaritan, but it's fine. But the closer he got, he realized that it's not a blanket, but a tarp. And when he gets even closer, he sees that there's blood all over it, which doesn't make him that concerned initially because it's an area known for hunting. But then when he bends down to inspect it further, he notices a piece of duct tape with long dark hairs attached to it and some kids clothes all covered in blood. But maybe it's not kids clothes at all. Maybe it's clothes for a petite woman, much like Gurley Chu. He gathered it up and eventually sent it away to the police for testing. It's around this time that police start being able to put together a clearer picture of Dyson Hosenkoft and his relationship with Gurley.
Police kept trying to reach Dyson to find out his whereabouts, but it was like he had disappeared into thin air. But then the calls started rolling in. There were three calls of interest made to the Albuquerque police. The first was from a divorce attorney who has worked on Gurley and Dyson's separation, who was reporting that Dyson had recently called him and made loud, threatening comments to him on the phone. In fact, all three of these callers were calling to report that Dyson had called them in a huff of anger. The second person was a former neighbor of Dyson, who said that the night before Gurley went missing, she had seen him get out of his car dressed in full camouflage gear and what looked like black face paint covering him head to toe. She thought it was weird, but she knew him to be a pretty strange guy and didn't think too hard about it. That is, until he called her and threatened her life. Now, the third person is where things get interesting. The woman who called was named Vonda, and she was working as an adoption director and coordinating the process of Dyson giving up his three-year-old son, Dimitri. Yeah, you heard that right. Dyson had a son. And the story behind it is messy. A few years back, when Dyson had gone on one of his many trips, one day he returned home with an infant child of only one month. He told Gurley that the little boy had been orphaned in Mexico by a friend and he had no choice but to step up and help. He presented the child to Gurley and although she was confused about what had happened, she was excited because she really wanted to be a mother. And if you're thinking that this story is weird as hell, it's about to get even weirder. Vonda said that Dyson wanted to give up Dimitri because he was dying of cancer and only had a month to live. But as part of the adoption process, you have to do several background checks and take some medical exams. So when the results of the tests came back, it was revealed that not only did he not have cancer, but also that Dyson was Dimitri's biological father. When she asked him who the mother was, he responded by saying that the child was grown in a lab using harvested eggs. Yeah, you're starting to see what kind of guy we're dealing with here. Vonda was clearly very shaken up about all of this, so she told her husband about it while at a restaurant. And by some weird coincidence that I have no further explanation for, Dyson overheard this conversation because he was sitting a few tables over, completely randomly. And because he felt so betrayed and enraged, he called her up and threatened her life just like he had done to all the other callers. So with all three of these calls as evidence, the police traced the number and what came up was a house in Charleston, South Carolina. They have finally found Dyson. When they first tracked him down, they found that Dyson was engaged to a new woman who was living in the house with him. They soon found out that he was also engaged to three other women and none of them knew he had a missing wife on the West Coast. It had also come out that Dyson was a certified scam artist. He was known to sell fake cancer treatments and life-saving injections, made tens of thousands of dollars from his scams. Oh, and also the name Dyson is a fake name, which you probably would have guessed. His real name is Armin Chavez. And again, he did not have cancer, nor could he cure it. So investigators proceeded to search his new house and found some questionable items, including a gun, lots of prescription medication, needles, two vials of blood, and both Gurley's address book and her Malaysian photo ID. They also found a steam cleaner for carpets, but let's back up a little bit and talk about some of the other players involved here, because Dyson absolutely did not act alone. Before they nailed down Dyson's location, they got in contact with a woman by the name of Linda Henning. She initially claimed that she hardly knew him and had never heard of Gurley, and she would say this in court as well, but all of this was eventually contradicted. There was even security footage of Linda going to the bank Gurley worked at and having her as a teller. As Linda was asking more questions about Gurley's disappearances, things devolved very fast. She started bringing up conspiracies about government officials and about sex rings. In fact, these conspiracies are how she met Dyson. They met at a seminar centered around a conspiracy involving shape-shifting reptilian aliens disguised as our world leaders who drink human blood for substance. Linda and Dyson bonded over their respect for this speaker and soon a relationship blossomed. 
One more thing about this conspiracy theory. It's in the doctrine that the best blood for drinking was full of hormone secretions that can only be from a woman who's been tortured and murdered. So, just keep that in mind. Linda would go on to tell her friends that Dyson and her were going to get married, but her friends were worried for her. Many of them claimed that her personality had drastically altered, and it was almost like she was in a cult. But nevertheless, their affair continued on, and they became regulars at a UFO fandom group where Dyson was eventually deemed to be too weird even for that group. And apparently he told people that he was a doctor and a geneticist with degrees from Cornell and the University of Tokyo, as well as being a 4,000 year old immortal alien. So that's the second person in this merry band of idiots. And the third person is a man named Bill Miller. He was also allegedly a member of their UFO group and was known to boast about how he knew more than he could say about Gurley's disappearance. But most importantly, Bill randomly dropped everything to go hunting for two days right around when Gurley disappeared. When he was questioned by police, he admitted to knowing Linda and Dyson and said that he had been hired to kill Gurley, but had a change of heart. But investigators searched his house and found a whole slew of newspaper articles about Gurley's disappearance, as well as a notebook in his truck that said some very sketchy stuff about cannibalism and drinking human blood. Police then learned that Bill had a hunting cabin right by the location where the bloody tarp was found. He also opened a safety deposit box at a new bank using someone else's address on the day she went missing. Inside was $10,000 in cash and $12,000 in coins. So like we're talking about three people who were just very, very, very bad at committing crimes, which like, I guess, thank God, but also damn. People are evil and stupid. There was a mountain of circumstantial evidence building against the three, but it's very hard to prosecute someone without a body. Luckily, the DNA results came back and they were a doozy. The blood on the tarp was confirmed as girlies, as well as some of the larger stains on the carpet, but the smaller blood stains from the carpet were confirmed to be Linda's. In the carpet, they also found glitter, arts and crafts sand, and a lot of animal dander, like we're talking fur and feathers. And while Gurley didn't have any pets, Linda had six cats. The carpet cleaner found in the South Carolina house was later tested, and it also contained glitter and the same animal hair from the carpet of Gurley's apartment. And it was all coming together. On November 17th, 1999, Linda and Dyson were indicted on many, many charges, including murder and kidnapping. Interestingly enough, there were no charges brought against Bill besides conspiracy. The prosecution's case was strong because of the DNA evidence and Linda's credit card statement proving that she bought a tarp at Home Depot the day before Gurley disappeared, as well as a ninja sword. And I'm assuming that wasn't from Home Depot. The sword was later tested and there were signs of human blood on it, but it was indeterminable. The defense primarily relied on Dyson as a witness, which was not the best choice. He said a lot of truly awful and at times genuinely frightening and unnerving things. She knew she, knew she was going to be hunted like the dog she was. And yes, she knew like a scared rabbit in an open field, she knew. On the stand, Dyson claimed that he wanted her dead because Gurley wanted full custody of Dimitri. I don't believe that. She probably was starting to unravel his scams and bruised his fragile eagle or something. He also said that he hired Bill to kill her and he was in charge of cleanup. He also said that Linda wasn't involved and the reason her blood was found on the crime scene was because he had bought a vial of someone's blood to confuse the police. But, and you'll never believe this, it broke in his pocket. So he just used a vial of Linda's blood instead. So yeah, they were found guilty on all charges. Bill didn't stand trial till 2003 and got off with a very light sentencing. Linda got 73 years and Dyson avoided the death penalty by saying he would tell investigators where Gurley's body is. But to this day, he has never said a word. Which leads me to believe that something truly horrible must have happened to Gurley. 
I fear that something along the lines of the alien reptile consumption happened to her. To end on a lighter note, Dimitri was adopted and lives anonymously now under a new name. He has no connection to his biological father. And that is the very sad and twisted case of the murder of Girlie Chu. It's so tragic that someone was taking steps to get out of a bad situation and save herself, and yet was struck down in the end. It's even worse that in the commotion of the larger-than-life characters, Gurley seems to get lost. But we will never forget the woman with the big, welcoming smile and the shy eyes that was Gurley Chu. As always, thanks for watching, and remember to subscribe below.